Hi, I'm Ken Riley, pastor of Hewitt Community Church, and I want to thank you for taking the time to visit with us today. If you're inspired by what you see or by what you hear, or you'd like to know more about Hewitt Community Church, then please visit our website, hewittcc.org. Good morning, boys and girls. Do you know that this week is Palm Sunday? It's the week before Easter and we're celebrating Palm Sunday and we're gonna learn all about that and what we are celebrating today. Oh, oh my goodness, Andy. Andy, what are you doing? What are you doing? Hey, I found the most amazing plant. I this see. is so rare. I bet the boys and girls have never even oh, seen Andy, anything Andy. like it in their life. Listen, I, I hate to burst your bubble, what? but just like the blue bonnet, yeah. this is very common. Common? Yes, this is this is a palm leaf. A palm leaf? Yes. You already have they, a name for it? Yes, they, they grow all over, everywhere that it's warm, even like near the ocean and things. It's, it's very common. Lots of people have palm trees. Well, I thought it was special. Well, you know, it is special today because today is Palm Sunday. And a matter of fact, I was just telling the boys and girls, that's what we're going to learn about today. You know, Palm Sunday is the day that Jesus rode on the colt of a donkey and he came into Jerusalem and the people hailed him as king. As a matter of fact, they took palm leaves and they held, held them up in the air and they, they were worshiping the Lord with them and, and they called him king and they said, Hosanna in the highest. And you know, they even put them down on the ground in front of him so that the colt could just walk across them and not even have to walk on the dirt. Of they them. let the colt step on them on a special plan on the ground? Well, yes, because it was honoring him. It was like like today if we were to roll out a red carpet for someone who's famous or for royalty. What? How come nobody rolled out a red carpet when I landed on this planet? Well, no one rolled out a red carpet for me. I guess we just didn't know you yet. That must be it. Okay. Well, boys and girls, you know what? The people in that day, they thought Jesus was going to come into Jerusalem and he, they, were, they were proclaiming him as king and they were thinking that he was going to rule in that day. Matter of fact, they had been ruled by the Roman government for quite some time and they thought Jesus was going to overtake the Romans, that he was going to give them all the things that they had been waiting for. Well, you know what? He had a little bit of a different plan. And the people, they, the disciples and the people, they had what's called tunnel vision. Do you know what tunnel vision is? No, aliens don't get tunnel vision. Well, it's where, like, if you were to cup your hands around your eyes, boys and girls, you can do this too at home. All I can see is you. All you can see is what's directly in front of you. I bet, a, a, as a matter of fact, if I held up this piece of candy, I bet you could focus on these Skittles and I bet you could focus on it so much that you could see nothing else that's on the TV. And do you know, that we're going to let this candy represent something that the disciples really wanted. Like, they wanted to rule with Jesus. And all they could see was wanting to rule here on this earth. You know what? Here's, here's another piece of candy. See if you can focus on this one. You know what? Let's, let's let this candy represent fame, being famous. Letting the people in, in that day, they wanted them to know them. And you know what, boys and girls? Uh, sometimes we want people to know us. We want to have fame too, don't we? All right, well, let's, let's let this one, the Starburst can represent fortune or uh, wealth. And so they thought they would be very wealthy if they were ruling with Jesus. But you know, boys and girls, all they could focus on were the things that they thought they needed or that they thought Jesus was going to do. But he had a greater plan. As a matter of fact, his plan was so great, they didn't even know what blessing he had. They couldn't even see it. Whoa! Whoa! What? Hey, Pastor Stacy, I'm gonna go see if I can find myself some candy. All right, well, you do that, Andy. We'll see you later. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right, boys and girls, you know, maybe the disciples, they thought that it would be awesome to rule with Jesus during their lifetime. They thought it would be awesome to rule for about 40 years or so with him. But do you know what? Jesus thought it would be awesome that they would be with him for all eternity. You know, maybe the disciples thought that it would be awesome if everybody knew who they were, if everybody knew their name. But Jesus thought it would be awesome if they would be known for hundreds and thousands of years. You know, we even know the disciples today because of the Word of God. They thought it would be awesome 
to have comforts and to maybe have a couple of rooms in a palace uh, with Jesus. But God thought it would be awesome if they were to have streets of gold and to never have to shed a tear again in heaven. You know, boys and girls, God wants us to focus on the big picture that he has for us. And what things are you concerned about? What things have you been focusing on that maybe aren't part of God's picture? Take some time and make sure that you're focusing on what God wants you to see. You know, the Bible says in John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him should never perish, should never die, but have eternal life. Boys and girls, that's the big picture, and that's what God wants you to focus on. Well, I hope you have a great week. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. Hey HCC youth, Caleb and Julia here. We love you, we miss you, and we hope to see you soon. This week we're gonna talk about a pretty familiar Bible verse. It's John 3:16. so read it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Yeah, at times there is so much chaos and confusion surrounding us, it can be difficult to see God in a positive light. After all, if he is in control, can't he settle this storm? The answer is yes, but we must not interpret the chaos as him not loving us. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Today, be still and remember his promise that he will work everything together for your good. He loves you unconditionally and because of that, you can trust he will always keep you safe. This week, we really want you guys to focus on spending time in the Word and time alone with the Lord. Find your two or three favorite verses about how much He loves you and really think about those. By doing so, you'll get to remember how much He loves you. Again, He gave His Son for you. So focus on that this week and remember that no matter what, He will keep you safe. Well, hello, HCC family. Welcome to our third live stream service. I hope that this morning you are staying healthy, that you are staying safe, and I hope that you're staying sane. Um, please know that this, as this shelter-in-place thing continues to drag on, there is one thing that keeps me motivated, and that is the knowledge that I know that at some point this is finally going to come to an end and we're going to be reunited. And I don't know about you, but I am looking forward to that day. I, I kind of think that on that Sunday, when we're back together, it's going to be like a little piece of heaven. Now, that said, let me share with you some things that are going on here at HCC. First of all, beginning tomorrow, Monday, April the 6th, you should expect to begin to receive a daily email. Monday through Friday from either myself or a member of the HCC staff. Now, this email is going to con uh, contain a short devotional that is either composed by myself or a member of the staff. The purpose of this email is that we might collaborate together in order to stay connected to you and in order to somehow encourage you. Uh, my advice on this part would be to say that if you are not getting these emails, if for some reason you're not receiving them, then the first thing I would ask you to do is to check your spam or your junk file in your email. Some of those emails have been inadvertently going there. Or it could be that we don't have your email address or we have your email address incorrect. And so if you're not getting these and you would like to get these daily devotionals, then please email me pastor at hcc at hewittcc.org or uh, call the church office, uh, somehow give us a call, let us know so that we can add you to that email list. Okay, so that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is I want you to know that beginning uh, April the 8th, that's on a Wednesday, April the 8th at 7 o'clock, the HCC Bible study is going to resume via live stream. It's going to be presented in exactly the same format as this service today, with one exception being that Wednesday's live stream will actually be pre-recorded. 
Now, what that means for you is that you will be able to view that Bible study either on the HCC Facebook page or on the HCC YouTube page. It will be completely your choice. Moreover, it will stay up on those sites so that you will be able to watch that Bible study uh, in any other time if you, for some reason, are not able to watch it at 7 o'clock this coming Wednesday night. Those will be produced, of course, every Wednesday. Uh, the uh, Wednesday night Bible study is entitled Living the Good Life, and this is going to be a study in which we're going to examine Paul's letter to Titus. I believe that you will enjoy it. Moreover, I believe that it is relevant to this day and this age in which we're living. Uh, thirdly, allow me to bring you up to speed concerning our Sunday live stream schedule. As you have probably heard, it seems that Shelter in Place is going to continue throughout the month of April. Uh, sadly, that means that we are probably, until further notice, going to continue with this live stream schedule that we are currently on. Uh, sadly, that also means that we will not be able to meet corporately for Easter Sunday. Now, while that saddens me a great deal, I do want you to know that the HCC staff is already working together in how that we can make Easter and Easter weekend special for you and your family. I'm not going to give away any details. I don't want to give away any surprises but I just want you to know that we are working together to do that for you. And, and then finally, before I get into my message, there is one other thing I want to say, and that is I want to convey how astonished I am at your financial faithfulness to this ministry. Your, your generosity has just dumbfounded me. And, and it says two things to me. First of all, it says that you believe in this ministry, and I really appreciate that. But more to the point, it says that you believe in a generous God. You, you, you trust in God to provide for you, to protect you, and to shelter you during this trying time. That, that's what your giving actually says to him. And, and so I just want to say thank you for your financial generosity. And once again, let me say I miss you. I miss you, and I love you. And I am so looking forward to the day when we're going to be back together. All right. So having that uh, behind us, uh, let's continue. Let's get into the Word today. We are continuing in our series, That You May Know. And it is through this series that we are very slowly and methodically studying the gospel of Luke. This morning, we are going to be continuing in Luke chapter 21. But before we do, I, I want to do something that I have not done prior to this. And that is, I would like to ask that you would pray with me before we begin looking at the scriptures. So would you just right there at home, join me in a word of prayer. Father, we come to you in the name of Christ, and we thank you for the fact that it is through Christ and the work of Christ that we have this audience with you today, and we don't want to take this audience lightly. Moreover, we are mindful of your word, and, and the one thing that kept coming to my mind this morning is that the Bible implies that you are an instantaneous God, that the moment that we call on you, even before your name has completely left our lips, you are there ready, willing, and able to meet us where we are. You're an instantaneous God. Unfortunately, we are not instantaneous. Sometimes it takes us a little while to get acclimated. It takes us a little while to get used to something. It takes us a little while to get warmed up. And so that's the reason that I pray this morning. I I ask for two things. First of all, Lord, I ask that you would use me as your servant to speak your word. This, this word that you have today is important. It, it matters, and it's, it's relevant to us. But Lord, you know the frustration that I have with talking to a camera as opposed to talking to people. You know how in these last several weeks I have felt so inadequate and so useless and so bewildered by everything. And 
And so I don't know that that's necessarily a bad thing because it is forcing me in a new way to trust you and to depend upon you. And so I ask you, Lord, to just simply anoint me that I would speak not my words, but I would speak yours. Secondly, Lord, I ask for those that are watching this morning that you will center them, that they will be focused, that they will be poised and ready to receive the seed of your word. Because unless they hear it, unless they receive it, there's really no point in it going forth. Again, Lord, your word is powerful, but I believe that your word is especially powerful and relevant for us in this time that we are living in. We need your word to sustain us. And so at the same time that I ask you to anoint me, I ask you to anoint those at home, that they will be poised and ready to receive your word today. We pray these things in your name. Amen. All right. So as I've already said, we're going to be continuing in Luke chapter 21. This morning, we are going to be examining a startling prediction that Christ makes to his disciples. And so we're going to be starting this morning in Luke 21, beginning with verse 5. We're going to start by reading verse 5 and 6. As always, I'm going to be reading primarily out of the NIV Bible. If you at home have another translation that you would prefer to follow in, then by all means uh, do that. Let's look at the scriptures together. Okay, Luke chapter 21, starting in verse 5 and 6. It says, Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, As for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Okay, so as we've read, the disciples were fascinated with the temple compound, and it seems for good reason. Uh, historians tell us that Herod the Great, in an effort to win the favor of the Jewish people, spent an untold amount of money on the building and the expansion of the temple compound, so much so that they say by this particular time, the temple compound could comfortably hold as many as 100,000 people. Well, obviously, it greatly impressed the disciples, as it no doubt would have impressed you and I. But in the face of all this, as we've read, Christ makes a startling prediction. And that is that one day, this massive, impressive temple compound would be completely and utterly destroyed. And incidentally, that was a prediction which came true some 40 years later in 70 A.D. Okay, so Luke 21, 5 and 6 sort of sets the stage for us. Let's continue reading in Luke 21, 7, where the disciples respond to the Lord's prediction. Teacher, they ask, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to take place? Take place. Okay, so the disciples respond to Jesus' prediction with fundamentally two questions. When will it happen? And what will the signs be? Now, fundamentally speaking, those two questions are one and the same in that the disciples are asking for a specific timeline. Uh, I think it's only natural that they would have asked this. I, I dare say that had we been there, uh, that would have been the first question to leave our lips. When can we expect all this to happen? Okay, so let's now look at the Lord's response as we continue reading. Luke chapter 21, verse 8 and 9, where it says, He replied, Watch out that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name claiming, I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Okay, so I want you to notice here, that the Lord's answer does not exactly provide the timeline the disciples are seeking. But he does endeavor to prepare the disciples for the destruction of the temple in the form of four do-not statements. 
And it just so happens that the first three of these four do not statements are located in these very two verses that we just read, Luke 21, 8 and 9. And so I want to go back and review those. First of all, he says, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Here, Christ informs his disciples that in the days leading up to the destruction of the temple, there would be many counterfeit messiahs, if you will, who through their charisma and through their leadership skills and perhaps their oratory skills, they would deceive many and they would lead many into a false sense of security. And so Christ's warning to his disciples is this, do not be deceived, be deceived by them, do not be fooled by them, and, and this brings us to the second of his four warnings, he says, do not follow them. Do not follow them. Now, in this context, the word follow actually implies going backward. So Christ's literal warning is, do not allow these counterfeit messiahs to influence you to go into a backwards direction. Don't let them lead you into a backwards direction. Or you may say it like this. Christ was saying to his disciples, don't allow these counterfeit messiahs to convince you to allow history to repeat itself. Now, what is he referring to here? Well, probably he is referring to the mindset of Israel's ancestors in respect to the first temple, Solomon's temple. You see, back in those days, people believed that that temple housed the manifest presence of God. And for a while, it did. But here's the mistake that generation made. They made the mistake of believing that the temple housed the Spirit of God so that the Spirit of God could not leave the temple. Almost as if to say that the temple was a type of cage or a prison whereby the Lord could be manipulated and controlled rather than Him controlling His people. And so the mistake that they made was in believing that they could live any way that they chose. They could completely disregard the precepts of His Word. But as long as the temple structure stood, then they would remain safe and they would remain provided for and they would remain protected from their enemies. History proves that that is a mistake that they made on their part. And so Christ's warning to his disciples is this. As you see the days approaching the destruction of the temple, do not make the same mistake your ancestors made. Do not allow history to repeat itself. Don't make the mistake of assuming that this temple, this compound, is going to save you. Sadly, history tells us that on the day that the Romans destroyed the temple in 70 AD, there were as many as 6,000 people who had taken refuge inside its walls, actually believing that it would spare them and keep them safe. And sadly, they perished. What did they do? They went backwards. They followed the same path as their ancestors. Well, that brings us to the Lord's third do not warning statement. He says, do not be frightened. Don't be frightened. Now, in this context, the word frightened fundamentally means don't give up, don't surrender, don't throw in the towel. Now, that said, it's one thing to say, don't be scared, don't give up. But it's another thing to say there's nothing to be scared of. Christ tells his disciples in the days leading up to the destruction of the temple, he says, don't be scared. But he never says that there is nothing to be scared of. As a matter of fact, if you continue reading in Luke chapter 21, you will find that the Lord then proceeds to give a list of things which from a human perspective would bring on fear and surrender. For example, the Lord says in the days leading up to the destruction of the temple, there would be constant conflict. 
That's in uh, Luke 21.10, where he says, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And history indeed confirms that in the days leading up to the destruction of the temple compound in Jerusalem, Rome was almost constantly at war with somebody on some front somewhere, as well as involved in an escalating conflict with the Jews at home. The second warning that the Lord uh, gives to the disciples in respect to the days leading up to the destruction of the temple is he said there would be natural disasters. Uh, That's in Luke 21, 11, where he says, there will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilences in various places, and fearful events, and great signs from heaven. Uh, One example of what Christ, I think, is talking about here could have been the destruction of the city of Pompeii from the volcanic eruption of Mount Vesuvius. Perhaps you remember that from your world history class. But did you know that the destruction of that city took place just seven years before the destruction of the temple? And so it very well could have been one of the signs in terms of what the Lord was referring to and the warning that he was giving his disciples. It was a scary time to be living. And then thirdly, in the days leading up to the destruction of the temple, the Lord says to his disciples that they could expect to be persecuted for their faith. That's found in Luke 21, 12, where he says, But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and and put you in prison, and you will be brought before kings and governors and all on account of my name. All you have to do is read the book of Acts to find that this very thing that Christ predicted did indeed take place. And so Christ's point to his disciples was this. If you're looking for a reason to be frightened, if you're looking for a reason to be scared, if you're looking for a reason to surrender or to throw in the towel on your faith, you're not going to have to look very far. There is a lot of scary stuff that's out there. And it is scary enough and it is tempting enough to cause you to think about perhaps giving up on your faith. But the Lord's warning was, he says, don't do it. Stay true to your faith. Stay true to your Lord. Trust God to get you through it. And then that finally, that brings me to the Christ fourth do not statement. And that fourth do not statement is found as we continue reading in Luke chapter 21, verses 14 and 15, where he says, do not worry. Do not worry. Let's look at this together. Luke 21, 14 and 15. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. Okay, so in this context, that phrase, not to worry beforehand, it has to do with having a practiced or rehearsed response. In other words, Christ was telling his disciples, in the days leading up to the temple's destruction, and as you see these things unfold, It is not your responsibility to feel as though that you've got to figure God out. It's not your responsibility to feel as though you've got to offer people an explanation for everything that God is doing. Keep in mind, God is sovereign. And as a sovereign God, he never at any time owes us an explanation for anything. Nevertheless, Christ goes on to say, if at some point the Lord feels that an explanation is warranted, then he says he will give you the explanation at the opportune time. And he says it will be an explanation that cannot be opposed and it cannot be refuted. But in the meantime, all the disciples needed to know that in the events leading up to the destruction of the temple, there was one thing and one thing only that they needed to focus on, and they needed to focus on the, on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Using every single one of these events 
every single one of these signs, every single one of these temptations to encourage them that that day was approaching. But nevertheless, in spite of all of this, they needed to stay true to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, so what is the relevance of all of this to us today? Well, as you can probably guess, this is a lesson on preparation. Christ informed his disciples of what lay ahead. The temple would be destroyed. And he didn't want that event to take them by surprise. He wanted them to be prepared. Now, as to whether or not the disciples were prepared on the day that the temple was destroyed, I cannot say. But I can say this, they were properly warned. Well, having said that, in like manner, God's word has made another prediction. It is a prediction which is relevant to you and me. And the prediction is this, Jesus Christ is coming again. Jesus Christ is coming again. I want you to look with me at Hebrews 9.28 which says this, Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting him. In other words, Hebrews 9.28 is just one example of how the Bible has told us in plain and clear language that Jesus Christ is coming again, not this time as a baby born in a manger, but as a conquering king. And this information has not been given to us so that we can preoccupy ourselves with forming a timeline. This information has been given to us so that we might be prepared. Now you might ask, well, how do I prepare? How do I prepare myself and, and my family for Christ's coming? Well, I would say that you prepare yourself by heeding the exact same four warnings that Christ gave to his disciples. And so, if you will, I'd like us to go back and revisit them once again. First of all, the warning, don't be deceived. Now, as I've already said, initially, this warning was about following false or counterfeit messiahs. You know, I would like to say, or I'd like to think, that, that we live in a day where most people would be smart enough not to follow somebody who outright claims to be the messiah. Nevertheless, we do tend to sometimes create messiahs of our own. You see it a lot with sports figures or actors or politicians. You can even see it with uh, Christian celebrities or, or preachers. And while I don't want to say or imply that any of these people would ever intentionally mislead you. Now, there might be some, but I don't believe that most of them would ever intentionally mislead you. The question that we must ask ourselves is in respect to these people that we admire and these people that we would be tempted to make into a type of Messiah, these people that we would be tempted to follow, how do we keep ourselves from being misled? Well, the answer is that you don't follow people. The answer is you follow God's word. This opens the door for something that you've heard me preach, HCC family, probably a hundred times. And that is the importance of the expositional preaching of the scriptures. Now, just for the sake of review, what is expositional preaching of the scriptures? Well, it is two things. Number one, expositional preaching of the scriptures is preaching what the scriptures actually say versus what you would like for them to say. You see, when somebody's got an agenda, it's very easy to manipulate the scriptures to fall in line with that agenda. That's something that people have been doing for years. But the problem is this. The scriptures were never meant to fall in line with your agenda. 
but rather your agenda was meant to fall in line with the scriptures. As you know, this is an election year. Now, of course, with everything that's going on, we're not hearing a lot about the elections. That's found its way to the back burner, but it'll be just a few weeks and it'll be center stage again. And concerning your particular political candidate, you may, be, you may be very passionate about that candidate, and that's fine. But there's one thing you need to remember. That political candidate, no matter how much you might believe in him or her, cannot save your soul from hell. And yes, the Bible says that hell is a real place. Moreover, it says that people who do not know Jesus will go there. That's what the Bible says. Expositional preaching is preaching what the Bible says rather than what you want it to say. Well, that's the first thing. What's the second thing about expositional preaching? Well, expositional preaching is preaching the stuff you like and the stuff that you don't like. You know, nobody loves the promises or the encouragement that comes from God's Word more than me. Nobody loves preaching the encouragement and the comfort of God's Word to His congregation more than me. I, I love to tell you about the encouragement and the comfort that comes from God's Word. But you got to remember this. I can preach comfort and I can preach encouragement until the cows come home. And none of it is going to mean a single thing until you and I repent of our sin. Let me take you to Luke 9.23 which Christ says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That, that word deny, it means to forget or to lose sight of oneself. And so what that means for us is that denying yourself to be a disciple of Christ means a willingness on your part to accept the bad, right along with the good, to accept the difficult, right along with the easy, to accept the monotonous, right along with the fun. And so expositional preaching then is also preaching the stuff that you don't like as much as it's preaching the stuff that you do like. And why is expositional preaching so important? Because it guards against deception. It keeps you focused. It gives you clarity. And the Bible implies that it is a necessary component if you're going to be prepared for Christ's coming. That brings me to the second of the Lord's warnings to his people. He says, do not follow them. The application here is exactly the same. It's when it was applied to the disciples. It's saying, don't allow anybody to lead you in a backward direction. Let me give you an example of what that's talking about. Let me take you to Galatians 1, verses 6 and 7, where Paul is writing to the church, and he says this, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are returning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. In other words, Paul was conveying how astounded he was at how the, the Galatian church family, they were so quickly deserting the message of salvation through grace and going backward by embracing a message of salvation through works. Apparently, there were those within uh, the Galatian church family, influential people, who were pushing this agenda. Now, to say that they were pushing this agenda does not mean to imply that these were bad people. These very well could have been very good people. They could have been very sincere people. They may have had good intentions. The only problem was they were just going in the wrong direction. They were going backwards. What's the relevance here? Well, the relevance is here is how, as we prepare for the Lord's coming, how do we stay going in the right direction? Well, you follow God's word. You follow God's word. 
This brings me to something else that you have heard me say a hundred times, ACC family, and it warrants me saying it again. Don't you ever, don't you ever take any preacher, and I'm including myself in this, don't you ever take anything a preacher says at face value. Now, let me clarify. While indeed there are some shysters out there, I believe that most pastors and preachers and Bible teachers are genuine and they are sincere. I don't believe in their genuineness or in their sincerity that they would ever steer God's people wrong. I, I really believe that. But there's something you've got to keep in mind. All pastors, all preachers, all Bible teachers, without exception, are fallible. They may be sincere, but sincerity doesn't necessarily ensure that you're going in the right direction. God never intended for you, the church, to just sit and take something that a preacher says at face value. No, he intended that you would carefully consider what is being preached from the pulpit that you would go home, that you would study God's Word for yourself, you would allow the Holy Spirit to either confirm or deny what's been taught from the pulpit. Now, why did he intend this? Because it keeps you going in the right direction. It is paramount that as you prepare for the coming of the Lord, that you ensure that you're going in the right direction. And you will not necessarily be going in the right direction if you just take a preacher's word for it. The only way that you can ensure that you are going in the right direction and you are therefore prepared for the coming of the Lord is if you are a student of God's word yourself. If I was just saying so myself, I, I would say amen to that. I think this is pretty good preaching today. I hope that you're enjoying this. I know that I am. All right, so that brings us to the Lord's third warning to his people as we prepare for his coming. And that is, do not be frightened. Or more to the point, he is saying, don't give up. This past week, I got an anonymous letter in the mail. It was from an individual who was criticizing church leadership's response to shelter in place, the current shelter in place orders. Uh, it seems that this person saw our current shelter in place orders as a type of Christian persecution and church leadership's compliance with shelter in place orders as buckling or folding under that persecution. Uh, well, uh, sir or ma'am, if you're watching, I must respectfully disagree with you. I would advise you to read Romans chapter 13. Romans 13 very clearly tells us that those who are in positions of authority have been placed there by God, and they are indeed God's servants. And so it is our responsibility then to, to the very best of our ability to, to respect and to submit to those authorities, the only exception being when that authority attempts to impose something which is contrary to the precepts of God's Word. Now, I'm sorry, but as I see it, shelter in place was never meant to inhibit God's Word. If shelter in place was meant to stifle the Word of God, then from where I sit, it's doing a very poor job. Because from where I sit, shelter in place has done more to promote God's Word worldwide than anything that we have ever seen in recent years. Now, my point is this. While I do not for a moment believe that shelter in place is Christian persecution, I'm not so naive as to believe that Christian persecution does not exist. I, I know that it exists, and I believe that there are even forms of Christian persecution that are alive and well here within the United States. But here's my overall point. My point is this. Even if Christian persecution was non-existent, 
I could still find a reason to give up on my faith. I could still find a reason to throw in the towel. You may say, Pastor, why would you say that? Because Christianity, this Christian lifestyle, is an uphill struggle. Listen, if you have ever felt over the course of your Christian journey that you were swimming upstream, if you have ever been frustrated with yourself because there was some sin or some kind of bad habit that you couldn't overcome, if you have ever felt as though that in respect to your Christian maturity, you were taking one step forward and two step backwards, do you know what all that means? It means that you are completely normal. Look at what Paul writes in Galatians chapter 5, 17. He says, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. What's Paul saying here? He is saying that if you are a Christian, then you have two spirits, two entities, if you will, that are living inside of you. Now, the first one he describes as flesh. That's a carnal spirit. The Bible teaches us that we are born with this carnal spirit. And the primary characteristic of this spirit is that it is 100% self-centered. That's how you'll know that it's alive and well. But then the Bible goes on to say that at the point of salvation, God sends another spirit to live inside of you. It is the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of Christ. And the primary characteristic of this spirit, it it is 100% others-centered. The Bible goes on to say that as these two live inside of you, they do nothing but fight. Moreover, the Bible implies that they will never concede one to the other. They will never sign a peace agreement. And just because one is in control right now, that does not mean that the other has surrendered. What is the point? The point is, if you are looking for a reason to throw in the towel on your faith, then you will never have to look any further than yourself. But God's word says, despite the struggle and despite the opposition and despite all of the reasons to be afraid and to throw in the towel, he says, stay with it. You'll be glad that you did. But moreover, it's required of you if you're going to be properly prepared for Christ's coming. And that brings me to the fourth do not warning that the Lord gives us his people. He says, do not worry. Do not worry. You know, since this COVID-19 thing has started, I don't know about you, I've heard all kinds of things. I've I've heard that it's a manifestation of God's judgment. I've heard that it's spiritual warfare. I've heard that it's Satan's attempt at destroying God's people. I've heard that it is a conspiracy uh, to... Uh, suppress the gospel and the word of God. And I've heard that it's a a precursor to Christ's return. You might ask, well, which one is it? I don't know. I don't know. God has not told me. Apparently, he didn't feel that it was necessary to bring me into the loop. But you know what Luke 21 implies? Oh, let me continue reading it. Sorry, made a mistake here. Let me bring you, let me, okay, made a mistake here. Let me refocus. Luke 21, 26, 28. I want to close with this. Beginning with verse 26. It says, people will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on in the world. And then in verse 28, it goes on to say, but when these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Now, what is that saying? Well, Luke 21, 26 is saying that the thing that scares people the most, the thing that people worry about the most is the not knowing. It's the not knowing what's around the corner. It's the not knowing 
what's ahead that scares people because they don't know how to prepare. They don't know how to plan. One of the criticisms that I've heard lately against our government and our government leadership in respect to COVID-19 is that we were not properly prepared. And I don't know how valid of an argument that actually is. I can only say that Well, six months ago, who would have known that this was coming? Three months ago, at the beginning of this year, I would have never in a million years dreamed that I'd be holding church like this, where I'd be talking in an empty building to a camera. I was not prepared. And if you're looking for me to give you some kind of theological explanation as to why the COVID-19 happened, I I don't know that I can help you. Moreover, I don't know exactly for sure what's on the horizon with all this COVID-19 stuff. I don't know that any of us do. But you know what? There is one thing I know. And I know that my redemption is near. Through Christ, my sins are still just as washed away as they were before I even knew there was such a thing as a COVID-19. Through Christ, I am still just as loved. I am still just as protected. I am still just as provided for. I'm still just as much a part of his family. I'm still just as much a part of his plan as I was before any of this ever happened. And I know that absolutely none of this has done one thing to change the gospel. It has not done one thing to change God's love for you or his plan for you for your life. Christ said that during these days, when you don't know what in the world is going on, he says not to worry about finding some kind of explanation of it all, but just simply focus on the wonderful message of the gospel. How that Christ stripped himself of his deity to dwell with men. How he's born of a virgin and lived a perfect, sinless life. And then he gave that life once and for all so that we might be redeemed from our sin forever. How he was raised to life as proof that the Father accepted his sacrifice on our behalf. And how that one day he is coming again to take us back home with him. For those of us that have made him our Lord. How do you prepare for his coming? Romans 10, 9 says, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Two stipulations for salvation. First, you must declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Why is this a stipulation for salvation? Because the idea of declaring is about agreeing. Through agreeing, We, through declaring, we are agreeing with everything that the Bible says about who we are, that we are sinners. Through declaring, we are agreeing with everything that the Bible says about who God is, that he loves us. And through declaring, we are agreeing with everything that the Bible says about who Christ is, namely that he is Lord. And as Lord, he deserves to call the shots in our lives. And so that's the first stipulation for salvation. What is the second? It says we must believe that God raised Christ from the dead. Why is this a stipulation? Because it is your declaration that from this point on, you're going to humble yourself and you're going to go in the direction that he has pointed you. It may feel a bit awkward at first. And you will maybe even find yourself thinking, I don't know that I can do this. That's because you can't, and you never in of yourself will be able to. But the Bible says that God's power, the spirit that lives in you, within you, he will be the one that is able to keep you on the path. He will be the one that is able to keep you pointed in the right direction. And so believing that God raised Christ from the dead is believing that God can same is believing that God can keep you on the path that he has for you. And so I want to bring this to a close 
by asking you to pray this prayer with me. Now, last week I prayed this prayer, and some of you told me I prayed too fast. So I'm going to slow it down a little bit. You don't necessarily have to repeat this after me, but I would like to ask you to consider the words of this prayer, not just so that you can be saved, and not just so that you can say that you are prepared for Christ's return, but so that your life can be dramatically changed for the better. And so I'd like to ask you to pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I believe that your word is true. I believe that Jesus Christ is your son and that he lived a perfect life and that he died on the cross so I might have forgiveness of sin and abundant life for today and eternal life for tomorrow. And so I now confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. And I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I ask you to give me a new heart. I ask you to take control of my life and to point me in the direction you'd have me go. I ask you to help me to be prepared for your coming. Not just by in being prepared myself, but in being used by you to point others to you as well. Thank you for doing this. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want to close with one thing. I was so encouraged by this. This is an email that I got from Julie Grote. Many of you know Julie. Uh, some of you may not know her. Uh, that's because that she spends most of her time on Sunday mornings working over in our children's church department. And, and so she spends a lot of time ministering to our kids. But I have a lot of respect for Julie. I, I, I have learned a long time ago that she's very insightful in terms of spiritual things. And, and she sent me this email, and, and I asked if it would be okay with her if I shared this with you, and she gave me permission. And so I want to close with this. This is just so encouraging to me. And I hope it will be encouraging to you. Julie writes, as I see churches empty, church members separated and people being alone, it resembles a type of fast that we are enduring, individually as well as corporately. Not a food type fast, but a spiritual fast. The Lord's words about fasting came to mind that new wine will be put into new wineskins. I, I sensed that the Lord was telling me that the church corporately is going through a fast in order to receive a new wineskin for what he wants to do and what he wants to bring upon the earth. We all need a new wineskin individually and corporately so we can participate with him in the harvest that's coming. No doubt people are turning to God more than ever. This type of shaking in the earth is going to turn people back to God. And he's making us ready. Therefore, we should not despise these times of isolation, but recognize his hand and submit to his purposes. I sense that after all this is over, there will be many who will come seeking the Lord. Julie, I want to say that I 100% agree with what you're saying. And so HCC Church family, while I miss you and I long to be reunited with you, I want you to stay focused and I want you to stay encouraged. Someday this COVID-19 thing is going to come to an end and we're going to be coming back together. And what a day that's going to be. But moreover, the Bible tells us that someday that Jesus is coming back. And when he comes back, not only are we going to be reunited together, but we're going to be reunited with those that we have lost in death. And we will never again have to worry about the overshadow of something ever separating us. What a wonderful promise. So stay encouraged, stay focused. God bless you, and we'll see you next time. Thanks again for watching. If you'd like more information about Hewitt Community Church, then visit our website at hewittcc.org. 
And if you'd like, you can give by clicking on the button in the upper right hand corner. But most importantly, remember, if you've been blessed in any capacity from God's word, then you are automatically obligated to be a blessing to those around you.